Hello, friends. Uh, once again, we are preparing ourselves for the the readings. This time for November twelfth, twenty seventeen, the thirty second Sunday in ordinary time. Lily Murray is with me again. Uh, this time, I will be looking at the first reading, in, uh, which is from the Book of Wisdom. I'm on page two hundred and seventy two in in your book at the bottom. Today's reading from Wisdom is part of an exhortation given to kings and magistrates. The author, who is sometimes presented as the voice of King Solomon, addresses his readers as judges and princes. Royal persons were symbols in Greek culture of the ideal human person. By addressing his audience this way, the writer intends to inspire everyone to reach for the virtues of the ideal ruler. Not only these, those in palaces, but every human being has an exalted kingly dignity and should seek wisdom. Shortly after telling his audience that he is advising them to learn wisdom, the writer describes wisdom in the lovely poetry of today's reading. In this book, as well as other wisdom literature, that is, the Proverbs, the Song of Psalms, Song of Songs, and Sirach, wisdom is portrayed as a woman. Here she is resplendent and unfading, signaling a perennial and extensive beauty. While at times she seems hidden, those who love her and seek her can readily find her. In fact, she desires to make herself known, and the task and the task of the writer is to reveal her identity. Recognizing her requires constancy and engagement of one's whole person in the pursuit. Desiring her, watching for her, setting one's heart on her, keeping vigil for her. She is sitting at the gate, but will be missed by those who are not attentive. The seeking and attention required of those who desire her is matched by wisdom's own seeking and attentiveness. Many, well, when the many passages presented wisdom are brought together, her portrait comes very close to that of God. In this passage, the writer begins a sketch of her that will be more fully drawn in the subsequent chapters of the book. Each added dimension presents her as intimately connected both with God and with humanity. So, uh, at the, the comments to the left of the reading, a beautiful exhortation describing wisdom. Think of someone whose way of life makes them beautiful to you. Think of that person you as you proclaim. Uh, the next line, this reading demands that you smile as you describe wisdom. Otherwise, she will come across as a dry academic rather than a fascinating and generous woman. So keep that in mind. Uh, don't don't. Uh, and and what that's going to mean is your 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 voice is going to have more of a, a lift to it, and and uh, uh, rather than a downward feel to it. And it has to do in, in in a couple of things, but it has to do with the the way you you say the words. And, but specifically, I think it has to do with the way you end your phrases and sentences. If, if you come down hard at the end, it, gives, it doesn't have a feeling of lift. So now let, let's see if I can do what I just said I was going to do. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. Resplendent and unfading is wisdom. And she is readily perceived by those who love her and found by those who who seek her. She hastens to make herself known in anticipation of that of their desire. Whoever watches her at dawn shall not be disappointed, for he shall find he shall find her sitting by his gate. For taking thought of wisdom is the perfection of prudence, and whoever for her sake keeps vigil shall quickly be free from care. Because she makes her own rounds, seeking those worthy of her, and graciously appears to them in the ways, and meets them with all solicitude. The word of the Lord. So that last word, solicitude, means kindness. And I don't think I ever knew that until I saw it written over there to the left comment there. So solicitude means meets them with all solicitude. Okay. Reading to commentary. Some people have no hope. 
In this letter to the Thessalonians, Paul explains why believers should not be counted among hopeless people who grieve over those who have fallen asleep. Paul is not referring to the natural sadness that people feel when a loved one dies. That loss is real and painful. The hopelessness that concerns Paul comes from thinking that death is the end. There is nothing beyond our earthly existence. Hope is firmly founded on our faith in Jesus' death and resurrection, the source and pattern for those who die. Another affirmation that Paul emphasizes throughout this letter is that the risen Christ will come again. Paul uses the word parousia, coming or presence, Another meaning is the second coming, to announce Christ's coming again, proclaiming with the voice of an archangel and sound of trumpet. In the Old Testament, this audiovisual imagery is associated with God's mysterious appearance or theophany. The Thessalonians were afraid that those who die before Christ's parousia would be left out. Their concern is likely not only for those who have already fallen asleep, but for themselves as well, in case they also die before his return. Paul tells them that those who die before his coming will be the first to rise at the parousia, and those who are still alive when the Lord comes will also be brought into his presence. Amongst among Paul's most hope-filled words are, We shall always be with the Lord. Paul's description of the parousia is not intended to describe in literal terms the future coming of Christ. There are multiple ways in which biblical writers portray God's final victory and God's parousia. What Paul and others assure us is that Christ will come again and that we will always be with him. Paul's message is one of comfort, consolation, and abiding hope. The side comments is a, a didactic reading. Paul is not so much giving a, chronolog a chronolog chronology of the last days as he is emphasizing that all who love Christ will be together in the end. Imagine yourself consoling someone who has lost a loved one. What tongue would you use? The rest, in parentheses, those who don't believe in Christ and the resurrection. It's not inappropriate to grieve, but we do so while holding fast to our hope in the resurrection. This reading is, we use it a lot at funerals. This one, this yes. One, you see this fairly frequently. Okay. And that's a, that's a good way to uh, approach it as if you were doing it for, as they suggest, for someone who has lost someone. Okay. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, about those who have fallen asleep, so that you may not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose, so too will God, through Jesus, bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Indeed, we tell, this, we tell you this on the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will surely not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, with the word of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God will come down from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, console one another with these words. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue on with the gospel reading, which uh, is sometimes called the the parable of the foolish virgins. Uh, I'll read the, the 
commentary, or uh, yeah, the commentary, the bottom of 280. The parable in today's gospel is taken from Jesus' final discourse in Matthew's account. The entire discourse focuses on the last things, particularly God's final judgment, which will mean condemnation for the wicked and salvation for the just. The parable is related to apocalyptic literature, highly imaginative, dualistic, and future-oriented. There are multiple purposes in such reading. It exhorts people who are suffering to stand firm. It warns people of coming judgment. It encourages righteous living in the present. It urges vigilance, patience, and preparedness. And it engenders hope, even in face of the unknown time of God's final victory. In this part of his long address, Jesus uses parables that explain how believers should live in the present age as they await the parousia. The parable of the ten virgins has some apocalyptic features, such as dualism, judgment, and separation of the good and the bad. It does not, however, use the fantastic image, images that are often part of apocalyptic writing, employing instead a common experience of a wedding. The scenario comes from the first century Palestinian custom of the bride going in procession with attendants to meet the bridegroom and share in the wedding banquet. The context of the parable gives guidance in how to interpret it here as in the entire discourse. The focus is on being well prepared for the coming of the Son of Man, the, the bridegroom in the parable. The parable begins, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins. All who await the coming of the bridegroom are expected to be well prepared. They should have sufficient oil, a symbol that can represent all the good works such as mercy and justice and faithfulness expected of believers. Those who do not await the bridegroom with a full supply of good works can be expected to be excluded from the great wedding banquet, symbol of the joy of the kingdom of heaven. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus told his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones, when taking their lamps, brought no oil with them, and the wise brought flasks of oil with their lamps. Since the bridegroom was long delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight there was a cry, Behold, the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise ones replied, No, for there may not be enough for us and you. Go instead to the merchants and buy some yourselves. While they went off to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went into the wedding feast with him. Then the door was locked. Afterwards, the other virgins came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he said in reply, Amen, I say to you, I do not know you. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know the day nor the hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Okay, we've got holidays coming up soon. Thanksgiving's not too far away. I'm sure you're all really busy, but hopefully not too busy to find time to prepare. And I pray that God will bless you in that preparation. Thank you.